Um, and so how to locate fish. A big key is structure, right? Um, structure can be to your advantage in many different forms. Uh, whether it be a, kind of a resting place or a place of opportunity, um, a place where they're going to be moving around or coming back from. Uh, if there's a lot of kelp there, eel grass, uh, things like that. So structure is a big part of locating fish. Um, water, what type of water clarity. If the Skagit River or the Snohomish are pumping out tons of fresh water like they are right now, the water might be, it might not, this might not be ideal conditions to be fishing around those areas. And you're gonna probably wanna get somewhere where it's a little bit more salty, depending on how long they've been in the sound. Um, and then obviously bait. Yes, these fish look for bait, they don't. They're not looking for anything out. They're not just hanging out out there. It's not a, it's not a weekend camping trip, right? They're to feed, go to the ocean, feed some more, come back, make babies. So, and this is, this is their existence. This is what they do, they follow any. Um, tidal influence is big. Like I said earlier, if you're having super, super big swings, um, you're gonna fish a lot different than you're gonna have those days where the water's not moving at all, right? The days that the water's not moving at all are actually pretty prime. Um, but if you do have big tidal influence, and some areas do really well on big tidal influence, um, you can treat the sound like it's a two-way river. Find back eddies, find big structure where fish can take a break and hide. Um, that San Juans, uh, anyone who's fished the San Juans knows that you could be doing negative five miles an hour and your downriver balls are up at the surface because the currents are so fast. So you'll find an area where the current will just kind of pool around and hang out and it's a nice eddy for the bait or the fish, the Chinook can take a break. Um, predator pressure, like I said, Baby Island has like 7 million seals at it. Um, it can be pretty productive actually to fish Baby Island sometimes even with all the seals, but know where you're going to be fishing at um, based on predator pressure. Sea lions, um, other fish even, um, will make an effect on that kind of stuff. If you're fishing uh, Area 7 and the orcas show up, everyone, I mean, it pretty much is, it's like someone turned off a light switch. Area 10, same thing. Every now and then, even when the transient's coming through, uh, it'll be like someone shut the lights off. And, you, and then you won't even mark them sometimes. It's crazy. So just some kind of predator pressure's a big deal. Um, and you have seals hanging out in the back of your boat. Um, you staying there or putting up with it is only going to make yourself angry. So it's easier to just pick up and leave or uh, I think you can send them now or whatever, just as long as you don't permanently injure them. Um, and sometimes the like, least likely places will be a jackpot. Uh, and I learned that with the 49 feet of water thing. Sometimes it just happens. Um, you'll fish an area and say there's a big sandbar that comes up, right? And it's a pretty shallow area. So it's like normal 80 to 90 feet. And then there's like kind of a big sandbar that comes up like 30. Um, or a, a ridge that comes out that's kind of in a way, right? You would typically troll around it and weave your way around it. instead of coming over it, picking up your downriggers and then setting them back down. And sometimes those places are perfect. You'll come back and you'll come back down the other side and the fish are just waiting there. That's like the, like the bait is getting going to roll over the top of this thing and they're just waiting for the opportunity to come and smoke a bunch of bait right there. <clears throat> so this is a map of um, basically the, the 8182 line, right? So you have 82, Elder Bay, um, that area. So um, what I'll do, if I'm fishing an area um, that I've never fished before, I'll pull up a Google map. Pull up a Google map, right? What does this say? There's not really anything on here other than you might see some land structures. Um, like, you know, like, oh, here's a point, you know, if the tide's moving really hard, maybe I'll hang out right here or I'll go down here. Um, Holmes Harbor Green Bank area, you know, this. This is kind of a, if the tide's ripping out really hard, you might get a big eddy in here, or one right here, or one right here, depending on what's happening, right? Um, so I'll pull up a map. Uh, this is in Fathom, so they do this in feet. This is from Marine Ways. It's a pretty good online, free way to look at your structure on the bottom. It'll tell you sand and mud. Um, you know, sand, you're like, oh, well, I wonder if there's any fish hanging out there. Or maybe one day I want to fish for sand dabs or whatever. But this is not an app, this is online. Um, this is desktop marine ways. You can look at it from your phone, they don't have a mobile version for it that I know of. Um, 
So what now I'm looking at this, I'm like, oh man, okay, sweet. So there's some structure here, right? It's all, it's, there's, a, there's some high, you know, this is like a, a pretty good, possibly rocky or sandy structure, whatever this may be. There's a point here, one here, and it doesn't look, see how defined that is? This picture is taken at a low tide, um, just because I know this area, but you're like, oh man, there might actually be a really big ridge here. When you pull it up on the map, there's not really that big of a ridge there. You go, oh, okay, well, I mean, maybe it'll work out or not. So I'll start looking at stuff and I'll be like, oh, okay, I'm gonna check out this spot. Maybe I'll troll through here once. And I'll, maybe I'll troll through it like five or six times and see that, um, and I'll change different depths. And I'll go, and just kind of wonder why. I mean, this is a really good spot for calmer water on a rip and tide out of here, right? So if, you're, if you've got all this water moving out or whatever, or moving in, you're gonna kind of get a natural eddy in, in this region. And everyone kind of, Elta Bay is known for having some decent fish um, during derbies or whatever. It's a pretty popular area. Um, you know, anywhere you can try straights or here, here's another spot that I might look at for a back eddy. Um, I might fish this when the tide's coming out. Maybe there's a bunch of bait hanging out in this bay and they're gonna come, they're gonna get, they're gonna come out with the tide or maybe they stay. They're all, all worth looking at to see if there is potential for fish there. So these are just things that when I'm fishing a new area that I look for. Um, I do this in Area 7 a lot. Right? The islands are unique um, compared to fishing like 10, 8, 1, 8, 2, or 9. It's, just, it's a little bit, it's quite a bit different. Especially if you're fishing in the islands. Um, so I brought a picture of Cypress Island here. Um, this is where the net pens are at, Secret Harbor. Um, it looks like there's potentially a lot of structure here. You're like, oh, okay, there's a lot of stuff. And you can see on Google Earth um, some of the, the tide currents. Uh, now here is an underwater view of this. So, right, I looked it up on Google Earth, and I go, okay, this is right, I potentially want to fish here. I'm gonna go check it out on Marine Ways. So I pull it up and I go, holy crap, okay, there is a ton of rock here, um, sand and pebbles, that kind of stuff. There's some stuff to hide in, do whatever. So I'll look, um, you know, Eagle Bluffs, pretty popular, John's got a lot of information on Eagle Bluff, so I kind of know that area from other information, and I'll look at the bottom and go, okay, maybe I want to try fishing like right up in this hole here, you know, or whatever. And so that's a good spot to take a look at when you're looking at a map, and you go, oh, okay, wow, this could be a good kind of spot to hang out. Doesn't really see anything about the bottom, but there's some kelp beds that they marked on here, you know, um, reef point. So the tide's coming in, maybe I'll fish uh, none of these places. Maybe I'll come up here to Secret Harbor, but the tide's coming out. Or the tide might push the bait up, right? This is a super shallow spot. I think this one this one is in fathoms. Um, but this is pretty shallow, so you'll find sometimes you find some bait up on top of that. Um, Secret Harbor, where the net pens are at, a lot of people fish that in the summertime, and it can be pretty productive. So, <laughs> Here it is, right? Fishing different stuff, look at that. Oh man, and look, what is all this that's going on here? It's pretty shallow. I have some in 250 feet of water and half the screen's taken out. And I try to take pictures of these knowing uh, and trying to remember where I took them at. So I go, oh, okay, maybe I'll try out here. Another thing I wanted to show was that speed. And we actually caught a fish here and you can't see our gear because we were actually plunging the bottom pretty hard. Um, so you go on GPS, not speed through the water? I don't, uh, I do both. Um, and only, like I said earlier, because downriver cable angle, 45 degrees and 41 feet of water is, is flying. It's, it's, you're, you're screaming through the water. And, and not, not it's not unnecessary, so to speak, because if you're not catching fish, you might want to try it, right? But for me, in the wintertime, I don't fish over two and a half. Even with the current, sometimes I'll just go really slow. Um, and it's just kind of what I've done since it started. Um, we, after seeing a lot of fish get hooked on the inside rod sometimes, it, I just, I fish slower in the wintertime. In the summertime though, blazing trail through there, you know, passing people like we're on fire. It just depends. Uh, wintertime I fish pretty slow. These are my downriggers, that's, uh, there's some bananas. There's a chiquita. I've been trying to get free bananas from Chiquita and they, they're not, they're not playing. Um, but this is about how I feel about superstition right there. 
We can leave now. Yeah, that's. <laughs> there, uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, actually, one time I hucked a bottle, or I hucked a banana at a guy during a derby, and he gave me a bottle of scotch. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> um, yeah. You guys have any questions? Hey, tell, tell me how you fit widow. Widow what? Widow. Yeah. Widow. Like. Widow. How do you fish that? You're talking about Widow Isle, right? Yeah. Um, well, it depends. Are you talking about, so you know the hop that's out in front of Widow Isle then? I know there's a bunch of rock structures and stuff there, yeah. Um, I fished there a couple times in some derbies and stuff. Uh, last year it was actually super unproductive. Um, you'll see a lot of people kind of take the turn. Well, you see bait in there, but and sometimes you'll see high, you know, fish at like 40, 50 feet in, even in 150, 160, so. Mm -hmm. um, so, I fished Widow with, with a couple guys in the back a few times. They're probably going to be pissed at me for this. <laughs> uh, I go right over that hump, usually. And I typically, I most often fish that area um, probably 10 feet off the bottom. But you're working, so you're kind of moving your gear over. You'll see a lot of guys cut out. Um, there's some old school anglers that do the cut out and they do really well up there. But I don't ever go, I don't never out in 160 out there. I typically, if I'm going to be fishing with the, I don't know, 100 feet, 110 feet, because um, that whole area, um, like a whole bunch of it's steep too. Yeah. It drops off super fast. Um, and I don't really, I, I haven't done really well in the wintertime fishing. Fish really. east to west off the Tsunami um, Point or like Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I knocked off uh, Ed's fish one time during a derby for the net up there, actually. It was, uh, it was a proud moment in my life. I'm sure it is, too. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Any opinion on those blinking lights you put on the little Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. I love them. Oh, man. Everyone says, yeah, you know, I don't use them. Um, uh, a couple of the guys I fish with are pretty old school, and if it was their choice, they probably wouldn't use tape on them. Um, I don't. John swears by them. I don't fish at all. I don't use blinking lights. I am, I am fairly successful. I try to be at least, you know, because um, it's no fun if you're going out and not catching anything. Um, I have no experience with them whatsoever. Um, and I don't really know, a lot of the guys I talk to, some of them run them and they do really well, but we're kind of all catching fish out there. So, can't say one way or the other, to be honest with you. It's another one over here. With the current, most of the time, or do you go both ways, or do you? With or against, with or against. It does. I mean, it, it seriously depends on your area. It depends on what the bait you're doing. Um, so there's an area that I fish that has a has a really. I mean, it's flat, and then it just dumps off. And you troll 20 yards, and you'll go from like 70 feet to like 140 feet, and. Um, tip, we'll troll that in either direction, and the only reason. That I, you know, that I would say troll it either direction is in that area. I am a firm believer that the Chinook are kind of just hanging out on this shelf. And what happens is, is, is you'll mark a lot of bait up on top of this. And I think when the current comes through, it rolls them off. And they're, they're just waiting for that opportunity. And they're picking them off, picking the bait off as they're rolling off the end of that structure. So, I mean, in the San Juans, right, if you're fighting, if you're not going to fight a, a hard current off there. So, um, with typically, depending on your area. But if you're in an area that doesn't have big tidal exchange, you can fish both. You'd be fine. And if you're getting fish in one direction, pick your gear up at the end of your troll and come back around and hit it again. God. Alex, what's up? So, why would you choose the fluorocarbon over mono on your leader? I like the stiff leader. So, like I said earlier, I like to have my flasher kind of whip my gear around to give it a little bit of a different presentation. Um, some people use mono, and mono, you know, mono, it does stretch and has some dip to it. Um, so if you've got, if you got a fish on, right, and it's kind of head thrashing a lot, sometimes you get fish that just go berserk. Um, it might be nice to have it. I don't run it. I run fluorocarbon just because purely for action is why I run fluorocarbon. Oh, are you a fan of scents on your on your metal 
Um, I do sense, I've tried to go away from them a little bit, um, like the Mike's UV Smelly Jelly Herring. Um, it kind of makes a mess of your gear, it's hard to clean. Uh, and I take over my wife's dishwasher for a drying rack all the time. Uh, she gets really mad at me. She gets really pissed. Uh, mostly because the baby stuff's in there. And, uh, and so I've got like eight million flashers lined up inside. So it does make a mess, and my wife does not really appreciate it. And so I end up scrubbing the dishwasher sometimes. That's a no. That's not a no. It's a sometimes. Depending, depending on how hard it is, right? Uh, and if I do, I don't put them on the spoons anymore because they're really hard to wash. It's easier to put it on the tail end of the flasher, and then it's and you can wash the flasher off a lot easier. Um, it does take a little bit. I use Dawn. Some people, Mike, uses Lemon Joy. Uh, I'm sure there's some Lemon Joy people here. I use Dawn. They scrub, um, you know, oil covered ducks with it, and it works really cool, and it cleans it really well. So. Um, you could run them, but they build up with a bunch of gunk. Okay. And so you're throwing stuff around a lot, um, and you'll, you'll build up with gunk or some grease in the motor will get stuck to it, or uh, you'll have a big day of pollen, and it'll stick to that. Um, for salt, when I salt my herring, I use uh, Kroger's, or I live right by Fred Meyer, so I use Kroger cor uh, coarse kosher salt, um, non-iodine salts. Um, some people use uh, rock salt. I think it dries them out faster. Um, kosher salt has worked really well. I don't even, I get them just to where they're thaw enough that they would split apart off of each other. And then I just, I put a, a layer on the bottom of the Tupperware, set the um, anchovies is what I use, and then I'll put a layer of salt right on top of that. Um, I don't use any scent in my anchovy mix. Just salt typically. Dye them? Huh? You said you dyed green? Yes, for every 10 I'll dye green. Um, just food and, huh? Just food coloring? No, I use the Procure or the fire brine dye that you can get in the um, small bottles. A lot of the Kopany anglers use it to dye their corn and it's pretty potent stuff. I do not. I wear gloves because it, it does stick to your hands pretty bad. Um, I don't think it's very, it's not toxic. Though it is when you do throw your anchovy out with that or herring, um, it looks like hamper breach is at the back of your boat. And, it, and so, yeah, you'll see these clouds. I one time I had some extra and I didn't want to keep it and I dumped the bag out and then I was like <laughs> looking around, you know, like oh, we gotta go. <laughs> no, uh, well I'll dye them and then I'll salt. You'll dye them and then yeah, dye and then salt. Uh, did I answer all that? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. I uh, don't. No. no. Uh, I do have some, there's some Gold Betsy styles on the table, but no, I don't use Super Betsy. So you, you like them? I'll have to give them a shot. Uh, any other questions? I wanted to hit one more thing. Uh, that I didn't cover and I forgot and I remember. I know that everyone has their traditional gear that they use and they like. Don't drag it around all day if you're not catching fish. Wayne has fished with me and I'll go through 20 flashers in a day. If I'm not hooking fish in, like, I mean an hour to push in, if I don't hook a fish, I start throwing gear out of the boat. I don't care, I just want different gear on. So I change gear a lot. Um, it works really well for some of the company guys. Um, but yeah, every I, sometimes I'll change every 15, 20 minutes, especially if I'm marking a lot of fish and I'm not hooking anything. I'll just change gear constantly, and it might just be a color or glow. What's up? What's your set back? Off from the downrigger ball? Yeah. Um, depending on twice, what you're using. Huh? Depending on what you're using. Yeah, but uh, and depending on where you're fishing, current San Juans, I use super short because uh, tangle ups issue but uh, a good number is twice the distance of the boat. Be pretty good, unless you're on a 30 foot boat and you're 60 feet behind the boat. So uh, 35, 40 feet sometimes. Uh, high currents, five feet right off the ball. The Canadians in House Sound fish really deep waters where the fish shallow sometimes. So all their stuff is really short. And when you're getting really deep, you are fishing really deep, 
really short setbacks aren't going to matter because um, it's going to be pretty dark down there. Fish plugs at all? I don't fish plugs. I don't. And uh, uh, Ron would be a good uh, yeah. reference for plugs. Yeah. Um, I don't. I have never fished plugs actually. I know some of these guys are. <laughs> I know, I keep seeing pictures of people catching some nice fish on plugs. Uh, Foley, during the Resurrection movie last year, had a nice fish on a plug. So. Cool. I think I've covered everything. Any more questions? No? Cool. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming out. I appreciate it.